And he's, he's also an author of a book about Spark, right? Right, which is one of the uh, tools that you'll probably encounter uh, when, you, when you get into big data. But we also have uh, Reynolds Shin, who is uh, the founder of Databricks, which is a company that is also out of Berkeley. Start out of Berkeley. He's a on leave from the East Department. Uh, I'm on leave for almost four so years. So I don't need that. I'm doing my PhD. And, uh, so you just need to either get taken over or go bankrupt, and then you can come back and, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. finish your degree. Yeah. Um, I guess I can do it in the later. Yeah, so, uh, so you, you can, you're going to chime in and then kind of wrap up uh, at the end. But first, uh, Mohammed, give us, a, give us the overview. Thank you for inviting me, Greg. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, like, Greg mentioned that I'm a Haas MBA. It's almost more than 10 years, actually, since I sat in one of those chairs. So it's good to be back. Uh, so let me share some of my stuff. Uh, but before we get started, let me do a quick poll to have a sense of how deep I can go. Uh, how many of you have computer science background or some computer-related education? OK. How many of you have worked in a, as a, in a technical role in an IT company or a technology company or even a non-tech company? Technology company. Okay, so some of you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'll keep it very high level. Uh, now, one of the thing happens is uh, when you work in certain domain, right? There are a lot of think terms that you become very familiar and you take it for granted that everybody knows. And obviously, that's not going to be the case here. So, if there are some terms that I'm using that doesn't make sense, just stop me. Uh, in fact, when I was a student, right, the way I learned most was by asking questions. That's how I kept awake in class, basically. <laughs> Every time I feel like I'm dozing off, I'll just ask a question and would get engaged again. Uh, so a quick intro, I'm going to skip this since Greg already did the introduction. Only thing I would like to add is, um, so my passion is basically building products. I've always worked in startups, except for one anomaly, which was IBM where I spent five years after my MBA, uh, but then I realized I was missing that startup thing, building products, so I went back to the startup world uh, and kind of do both technical as well as non-technical, uh, uh, have responsibility in both areas. And if you have uh, questions, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter. I'll be happy to answer any business or technology-related questions. All right, so a quick... <clears throat> Greg mentioned about the book. This is the book that I wrote on Spark, which was published last year. Uh, pretty much goes in depth. It's more technology focused, so it's meant as a primer for people who want to get started in big data, don't under, have no clue where to start. So this kind of states, starts from the basic and kind of builds up all the way to the advanced level. What are the different things you can do in Spark? Quick intro of Glassprint, the company where I work. We basically allow product manufacturers to do analytics on unstructured data. So typically when your data is structured, right, you can put in an Excel spreadsheet, for example. You can do a lot of different things on it, right? You can do regression analysis, all that stuff. But when your data is not structured, uh, for example, Twitter feed, for example, right? It's not structured. It's hard to do <coughs> analytics on it. So we actually take unstructured data from devices and allow our customers to do analytics on it. All right, so here's the agenda. Um, so I'll start with the big data overview. Most, I think some of this stuff is probably already covered in previous classes, other lectures. I just want to kind of do a very quick intro so we are all on the same page. Then I'll talk about some of the challenges associated with that. And then we'll talk about different uh, technologies that are out there to help you, help you solve those problems. Uh, and then towards the end, basically, I'll kind of bring them all together, how all those pieces fit together. And since we may run short in time, uh, I might skip some of this stuff or I might go too fast. Uh, but if something doesn't make sense, feel free to stop me. So this is like uh, sometimes I do a two-day workshop at different universities or conferences. So this is two days compressed in 45 minutes now. <laughs> All right, so let's quickly talk. Uh, and you may have seen this chart before. So one thing that has happened over the last decade is explosion in data, right? There's almost exponential growth over the last five, six years. And the big, two big contributors are social media and IoT. Social media probably are all familiar, right? So Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, people are constantly posting data, right? Whether it's video, status update, audio, whatever. But a bigger uh, thing is this thing called IoT. So what exactly is IoT? It's nothing but basically a network of devices that are embedded with software and sensors that are constantly collecting data and sending it over the internet. So that would include, for example, your phones, the smartphones, right? They constantly know where exactly you are, what apps you are using, how much time you're spending in different apps. 
If you have a Fitbit device, right, same thing, actually, it's constantly collecting data. And a lot of the equipments even at home, uh, you have, like, for example, if you have uh, Alexa or Google Home, that's collecting a ton of data, sending it back. So more and more things are getting instrumented, and they're generating a ton of data. A subset of IoT is industrial IoT. These are expensive devices that are more complex in functionality, and they collect a lot more data than your traditional consumer IoT devices. So I've shown some examples here. For example, in a medical hospital, you may have a CAT scan machine, X-ray machine, and just over a period of a few days, they might collect terabytes of data. So you may have seen this is another very popular chart, common chart, right? What exactly is big data? Typically, big data is data characterized by three Vs, and people have extended that to four, five, six, but the three common ones, right, or the main ones are volume, which refers to scale of data, and we're, here we are talking about terabytes and petabytes of data. Uh, the second is the velocity, the pace, uh, pace at which the data is getting generated. So I've give, shown a few examples here. For example, on Facebook, of, there are five million likes every minute. On WhatsApp, there are 21 million messages every minute, right? And what that means is, right, if there are 21 million messages, for each message, WhatsApp is collecting some data, right? And that just adds up, right? So even in a, in a day, it's going to be a humongous amount of data that they're collecting. And then the third view is the variety. So traditionally, all data, data used to be structured that you could put in an Excel spreadsheet or put it in a database. That's no longer the case, actually. Most of the data is unstructured. For example, the data that we get is all text files, basically, and then there's no way you can put, put it in a spreadsheet or a database and just start doing analytics on it. So what are the challenges uh, with big data? There are three main challenges. One is, how do you store all this data, right? There's a ton of data. How do you process it? And third is, how do you get value out of it, right? At the end of the day, you're going to spend money on storing and processing it. So you, unless you're getting value that's more than what you're spending, it's useless to do that. So let's talk about the storage challenge. Historically, the data would get stored on SAN or NAS storage devices, and it would either go in the RDBM or so on the file system as files. That was the traditional way of storing data. But these are expensive. The NAS and SAN US, they are very expensive. So you're storing terabytes of data on these things. You'll pretty quickly go bankrupt, actually. It's a relational database. Right. RDBM is a relational database. So that's like Oracle or SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL. The other issue is, besides cost, the relational databases, or even Excel, right, these are not meant for unstructured data. And they can't handle the velocity as the data is getting generated. So that's the other issue. And third is the file systems. Typically, they were designed to manage files on your laptops, right, or on a server, one device, right? So uh, again, on a single server, you, there's only a certain limit uh, to, uh, to which you can put data on it, right? two terabyte, three terabyte at the most, depending on how big the disk is. All right, let's talk about the next challenge, which is the processing challenge. How do you process that data? So typically, again, historically, most of the data that organizations collected would be in a database, and they would basically, the database itself provided some tools. Uh, so one of the languages that they used is called SQL. It's a query language. So basically, they, they would use that to do different kind of, get insights uh, from the data. But today, Organizations want to do a lot more than that, right? That's just one very small use case. There are a thousand other use cases that you can just solve with SQL. And then the other issue is the amount of time that you have to process that data. So again, traditionally, when people were doing analytics, right? So uh, one of the use cases was organizations would print uh, daily reports how the business is doing. So typically, they would fire these jobs uh, at night, and in the morning when the managers came to work, they would have that report. So there, there's almost uh, eight hours, so sometimes even 24-hour window during which you could process that data. That's no longer the case. There are a lot of applications where you want uh, information right away. You can't just wait for eight hours or even eight minutes, actually. Quick, quick question. So um, how do you use SQL in my previous rally? To what extent are like, data pushes an optical way? So like, reporting databases versus like, a live database that is like, actually engaging with like, the Walmart.com e-commerce e site? Like, I feel like in terms of how do you make sure that you're not compromising some of the databases that run your business versus those that are just reporting databases that may require an overnight right. So process. Actually, that's a pretty good question, and I'm covering it towards the end. So just remind me. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it. Right. Uh, so the next thing is how do you get value out of the data that you've collect, collected, right? Uh, one of the historical, and I've shown some use cases here. We'll quickly go through each of them. 
so the historical use case was BI, right? You want to know how your business is doing, what's the customer growth, what's the revenue growth, what's the profit growth, that kind of stuff. What happened to your business, right? You're kind of looking in your rear view mirror. And if something is not going well, then you want to find out why it's not going well. So again, you could answer those questions by going through your data, right? Figure out, okay, if sales growth has slowed, is that, has it slowed across the all regions or has it slowed in specific geography? Uh, is it because there's a supply issue? Uh, and if the profit has dropped, why the profit has dropped? So it, that's the traditional use case. In addition to that, there are a lot of custom applications that organizations are building on the data that you're collecting. So a good use case would be Google search engine, right? Every day they have a program that goes and finds out all the pages that are out there, right? And then it indexes that information. And so when you do a search, it's not like it's going and actually doing a real-time search, right? It has already indexed all that and just goes and does a lookup on that index, and that's why you get the response so quickly. So that's a custom, very custom use case. Uh, and pretty much all the search engines do that. And the other use case is log analysis. So every time you go to any e-commerce site, they actually log all that information and then they can analyze that so they can see, okay, how many people came to our website, how many of them actually were able to did some transaction, how many of them left the transaction halfway. So all of that information is coming through analyzing the logs that the web server is generating for them. Technical support is another use case. In fact, that's what we do. So when we take the data from all the devices, if the customers want to find out what went wrong with the device, right, it's very difficult to just go into the raw log file, uh, but the, all the information is there. So if you can figure out how to get that information, that becomes pretty useful to troubleshoot issues. Now there are some real-time applications. One is uh, in these, and I've only shown some examples here, right? So in the e-commerce case, for example, you may want to do fraud detection. Now that is something you want to do real-time, right? There's no point, let's say if somebody is uh, using um, uh, somebody's stolen credit card, right, and doing purchase. If you find out a day later, it's too late actually, that person is already gone. Ideally what you want to do is detect it right away, right, so you can stop the transaction midway. Uh, another use case in the financial market, you want to be able, if you are doing a high frequency trading, you have to make decisions in milliseconds actually, right, as soon as you see some trend, you want to be able to capitalize on that. Uh, another good use case is websites, when they show the ads, so typically the ads are customized for individual users, right? I mean, that's how they make money if you click on the ad. So they have to make sure that the ad is relevant for you, which means that as soon as you go to a page, they have information about you and they are able to quickly figure out, okay, what ad should I show to this user? Uh, and then <laughs> the next uh, use case is on the machine learning front, predictive analytics. So kind of continuation of what I described earlier. So when you're going to website, the the e-commerce site or the website owner wants to know what ads to show. Similarly, if you're going on a site like Netflix, right, when you watch a movie, they will show you all the recommendation. That's, again, basically using data to figure out what movies most likely you like and then recommend those to you. Uh, similarly, uh, in the IT infrastructure and environment, right, one way to figure out what went wrong is when the user calls and says, okay, the system is not working correctly, and then you figure out what went wrong. But ideally, what you should be able to do is, if you're collecting all that data, be able to predict when a system will fail, right? And that's a lot more better for the customer than you can actually proactively call the customer and say, look, this system is going to fail in 30 days, so I'm going to send the replacement part and we'll fix it before it happens. Uh, the next use case is using data to automate a lot of complex tasks. So typically these are things that are very easy for humans but very difficult for computers and you can make it easy again by using data. So I've shown some examples here, like for example, Siri on your phone that's basically data driven. Uh, autonomous, uh, in the autonomous machine category of self-driving car, again, it's all being enabled by data, right? So all the data that is getting collected, that's what being used to create the machine learning models and then basically uh, make this happen. Am I going too fast or the pace okay? Good, okay. All right, so now we understand there's a lot of value. What are the challenges, right? So let's start with, okay, you have all this data, you want to store it somewhere, you want to process it to get value, right? So let's look at a standard server. How much data can a standard server process? So I've shown you, it's a multi-choice multi -choice question. <laughs> Just pick one. Actually, there's no right answer. <laughs> that was a trick question. Um, so the definition of standard server changes. Technology gets better and better, so what was standard uh, 
what is standard today? Five years ago, it was probably high-end expensive server. Uh, and what's pretty expensive today might become a very standard commodity server five years from now. Uh, and the other thing is also the process time, right? The requirement, how, how much time you have to process data it depends from application to application. There are some applications where you, the response time might be a few seconds, so there you need something. Uh, your standard server may not be good enough, and there are, might be other applications where you have 24 hours to process the data, and your standard server might be good enough. All right, so let's say, so we know that, okay, one server cannot process all the data that you have. So what do we do? From a technology perspective, there are two choices. One is you scale up, the other is scale out, and I'll get, talk about both options. So in a scale-up architecture, basically what you do is you buy powerful high-end servers. So typically your laptop, for example, will have two cores, right, 8 gig memory. Now for a computer, typically there are three things that are very, very important. One is the CPU, right? That's kind of how much work it can do. The more CPUs you have, the more work it can do. Next is memory. Uh, the more memory you have, the faster things will run. Uh, so if you have two gig machine and suddenly you upgrade to eight gig, you'll see actually performance difference, everything else remaining the same. And the third is disk, which is just how much data you can store. So in a scale-up environment, basically you can buy really, really expensive servers, and this, they have a lot more CPUs than typically you'll find on a standard server. So like IBM, for example, has servers that has up to 150 cores. Um, and it can have under, uh, around uh, 10 terabyte of memory, and it's architected for very high performance applications, right? So that's one thing. And same thing on the disk side. Again, your typical laptop or server would have one terabyte, two terabyte disk, but there are specialized uh, storage systems available which can store up to petabytes of data. Ah. So you basically take this high-end server, club, uh, combine it with the storage, high-end storage, right? Now you have a very powerful uh, uh, infrastructure, or at least just two-node infrastructure. But there are some issues with this architecture. One is it's very expensive generally. So these servers are not cheap, like the server that I was talking about earlier, right? Minimum starting price might be $100,000, and then it can go up to millions of dollars. Not everybody can afford that. Uh, the other thing is you still have limited scalability, right? So even with that 150 cores, that's it. That's your limit. You, if you have application that needs more horsepower, you can't do anything about it. So let's look at the second option, which is the scale-out architecture. In a scale-out architecture, what you do is you put together a cluster of commodity machines, right? So you, instead of buying one really high-end server, you say, okay, I'm going to buy 10 cheap servers and put them together and you pull together the resources that are available on each machine. So I talked about three things that are important, right? The CPU, the memory, and hard disk. So you pull them together, and you have created a virtual supercomputer. So if each machine, for example, has, let's say, four cores and 16 um, GB RAM, right? That's the kind of typical configuration. So if you have 100 of these, now you have 400 cores, which is much more powerful than the earlier thing that we looked. Is this where VMware plays? So VMware is kind of the other way around. VMware typically, right, it takes your single server and carves that out into multiple things. This is kind of taking multiple computers and making it look like as one big, super full com uh, so, uh, powerful computer, supercomputer. So is there an application layer that coordinates across all the systems? Yeah, so we'll talk about that. Good, good question. So there are a couple of benefits with this architecture. One is that it's relatively inexpensive. You don't have to spend millions of dollars, actually. Uh, the other good thing is it's economical to scale. So you don't have to upfront spend $100,000 to buy an expensive server. You could start with three commodity servers. Each server might cost only $1,000. So with $3,000, you got a small cluster. And as your processing needs grow, you just keep adding more and more stuff. So I think the other advantage would be that it's more fault tolerant, right? Because you could have. Not by itself, actually. That's, again, a good point. And I'll, I'll cover that. And that's where I think Raynor can so also. Think, um, it's actually a tidbit here. Um, so this architecture was kind of popularized by a Berkeley company, uh, Intomi. Um, it was started as a research project in um, around mid-90s, and they started a company called Intomi, which became the largest IPO of 1998. Um, and then everybody started adopting this architecture. It used to be the case that the whole world runs on like, really beefy servers. Now they run on a bunch of tiny, mini, really cheap servers. And he is being modest, actually. He has also, his contribution is also pretty big, and I'll talk about it in a in few minutes. All right, but there are some challenges with this architecture as well, uh, and I think you, you brought it out, right? So one thing is that writing applications that can take advantage of this uh, scale-out architecture is hard. Uh, so since uh, as a program, I can tell you, right, when you're writing applications to run a single server, typically writing application that runs with one CPU, it's relatively easy. 
But to write program that can take uh, advantage of four or five CPU, that itself is kind of a magnitude of uh, order harder. And then to write an application that can take advantage of processing that spread across multiple computers, multiple disks, right? It's even harder because things can go wrong. Now, typically your laptop, right, generally doesn't fail very often, maybe sometimes once in a year, once in a three years. Same thing is true for servers too. Generally, they'll fail like once in five years. But when you put hundreds of these together, the probability of any one computer failing on any given day is pretty high, actually, right? So even if it's a there's 1% chance that something might fail, when you have 100 of those, something is going to fail on any given day. Uh, so that's the biggest challenge. How do you write application that can take advantage of this architecture? Uh, and I'll talk about the solution. So let's not talk about, now go back and let's talk about the storage problem, right? How do we store uh, data relatively in an inexpensive way? And that's where the distributed file systems come in play. So the file systems that you have on your laptop, it can manage only one device. The distributed file system basically make Hundreds of computers look like one virtual hard disk. So as, as far as your application is concerned, right, it doesn't have to really do anything special. It can treat it just like the way it runs on your uh, regular laptop. So I've shown a few examples here, and we'll briefly talk about the top two. Uh, but these are some of the uh, known distributed file system. SDFS is probably one of the most uh, popular open source distributed file system. And like I said, all it does is basically makes, combines the hard disk capacity that's available across a cluster of computers, makes it look like one virtual hard disk. And you can do reads and writes in parallel. And what that re really means is that when you write application, they will run much faster because they actually they can uh, read data uh, in parallel across from all those hard disks and write data in parallel. So things will mo go much, much faster. So if, let's say each disk, think of it this way, right? If each disk is one highway lane uh, that can go at certain speed, if you have 10 lanes and you can have use all the 10 lanes, 10 cars go at the same time, right? The combined throughput that you get is much, much higher. So the H there stands for Hadoop, right? Hadoop distributed file system, yes. Uh, the other one is Alexio. Uh, this actually came out of Berkeley. Uh, now, and this is also kind of doing the same thing what HDFS does, except that it actually allows you to store data in memory. Now, what's the benefit of that? Typically, when you're reading data, or any application, when it reads data from disk, it's a slow process. In fact, that's the uh, bottleneck typically in any application. Whenever it has to read data from disk, it's a pretty slow process. But if the data is already in memory, things can go much, much faster. And that's what Alexia allows you to do. So it's a distributed uh, file system that allows you to take advantage of the memory. This also actually came out, out of Berkeley. Um, Reynald, were you involved with this project? Uh, Tachyon? Kind of. Okay. <laughs> I made a couple push stacks, but very, very, very early days, and they still use that. Right now. Okay. Um, go ahead. So, if you have a very long script, um, I mean, I mean you, you need to run through the whole script, right, to, for the application to run. How do you, how do you make several computers like? So we have a computer running this line, and then you have another computer running this line. They're connected. I'll, I'll talk about it actually. Yeah, we'll come to it. Just in a few seconds. Um, all right, so that is Alex here. Now let's talk about, so the other way to store a lot of data, if you have a large amount of data. Now, one thing I didn't mention is pretty much all the stuff that I'll cover today is all the open source things that you can freely download with source code, right? Uh, the only thing that's not open source are the distribute, some of the distributed object stores. Uh, so in that bucket, basically there are three popular ones. The Amazon Simple Storage Service, or known as S3, uh, and then Google has a similar offering. So these allow you to pretty much upload unlimited amount of data. Uh, and the way uh, they are different from the file system, the file, there's no hierarchy, actually. So each object that you load has a unique ID, and it's a pretty flat uh, uh, architecture. I'll skip the details of S3. Uh, let's quickly go to distributed data store. So some of you are probably are familiar with databases, right? So typically, if you have uh, information that you can represent as a record, you'll probably put it in a database. So let's say if you are tracking uh, all the users, so let's say you build some uh, mobile app and you want to track information about all the users, right? So each user will be represented by a record that you could store in a database. So every activity can be represented by a record that you can put in a database, right? And that's how you typically will do. Now again, the traditional databases, they had limited capacity uh, and they would not scale. So people started writing databases that could actually run across cluster of uh, servers and pretty much provided the same functionality 
that your traditional sort of, uh, database is provided. So you can store data, you can read it back, you can make changes, store it back, and you can do analysis, analytics on that data. So the popular ones are <coughs> Cassandra, HBase, MongoDB. These are the top three ones there. Uh, so you'll hear people talking about this. Um, now, they are typically called NoSQL because in the early days, they did not support SQL, which was the standard-based language for doing querying data. or So pretty much anything you want to do with a database, that's the language you have to use. Uh, but this database, in the early days, they did not. But now they are supporting some flavor of that. Uh, the other dis the distinction is that these databases are meant for operational use. So where if you want to insert a single record, read it, <laughs> They are pretty good at that. They are not really meant for doing analytics where you basically want to go through all the records that are there. So they can store billions of records, but if you want to analyze all those records, that, this, that's not the right store, actually. But even if you have a billion record you want to read and write, they can do it pretty quickly. And you can easily scale, actually. So you can start with three node uh, Cassandra cluster, go up to 100 or 1,000, no problem. So with these data stores, are they mutually incompatible? Is it possible to switch from one to the other? Do do companies accumulate them? You know, people always say we've just introduced, we started using Cassandra. Does that mean that you have to stop using, right? The other it, data stores. It, it depends actually. In some cases, people might say, okay, my existing application, I'm happy. The pain is not as bad, so I don't want to spend time migrating into the new data store. And they might start new applications with the new data store. And in some cases, yeah, if there are certain, the application is breaking too often, they're having performance issues, then they might say, yeah, let's migrate. But yeah, actually there's an effort involved. It's not as straightforward. these have different pluses and minuses for different types of, of problems. Exactly. It's almost impossible to switch between them. It's mm -hmm. just the sheer amount. If you actually have an application in production, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's doable, obviously, like nothing is. But there's a lot of effort involved. <coughs> And they all have different features. A lot of them are converging. Um, Accumulos, like a special version of HBase, is built by the US in that intelligence community. I think it's built by the CIA. Um, the other ones are all commercial and um, have very different, fairly different characteristics. But because they're all, all competing with each other, they are now converging on the same set of All right, so these are the operational store, right? Now the next category I want to talk about are the analytics databases. So remember I said, okay, you can store billions of records, but what if you want to do analytics on that, right? You want to figure out who are my top 10 users, uh, where are my users spending? So if you have a mobile app uh, company, right? You want to know where exactly your users are spending time in, within that app. And you, so there are different kind of analytics you can do. So there's some data stores or databases designed just for those use cases. Again, I'm just showing the open source projects here that help you do, do that kind of stuff. Now there's another way actually you can build a data warehouse. I don't know if you guys have talked about it. So typically a data warehouse is where you basically put all of your data on which you want to do analytics, right? So I think somebody asked that question, what if I'm doing analytics on the same database where I'm collect, doing my transactions? And that strains the database, right? So typically what you'll do is not do analytics on the same database, but extract that data, put it in a data warehouse, and then basically do the analytics there. So either you can use a custom-made data warehouse solution, or you could actually build your own using open source tools. So one is basically use the um, distributed storage that we talked about earlier, right? Like HDFS or S3. So you put all your data there, and then use a distributed query engine, which uh, supports SQL, right? So SQL is a standard that most people know. So anybody typically who works with data, you know that language, and most of these tools that I've shown here, they actually support that, right? So you can, by combining that, you can build your own data warehouse solution. Renal, this is one of your expertise. Do you want to add anything here? Okay, um, one thing he doesn't, he's in Silicon Valley, right? And I think you are more of a tech company than, because our customers are mostly east of Sacramento, so we deal more with uh, probably enterprises. The aggregate, the open source phenomenon is really popular right now, but the aggregate market cap or whatever, the value captured by all the vendors in the open source part, which DataBricks is part of, um, is actually tiny, teeny compared with the actual data warehouse, which is kind of uh, legacy software. Right. But uh, I think we're talking about $10, $15 billion um, dollar every year going to data warehouses um, and growing at about probably single digit or low double digit. Um, this stuff are in aggregate probably less than a billion. 
um, but growing probably faster. Um, there is sort of a general trend that, um, actually it's interesting. I think a, about a year ago, it's a general trend enterprises are going more towards open source, but a lot of vendors um, also jump onto that, like we ourselves are part of that. But over time, um, people start realizing open source itself is not a great business model. So you're seeing actually probably a, a shift back to being uh, becoming more proprietary. Um, Cassandra, which is one of the examples uh, you cited earlier right. in the last slide. Um, so the, the backing company is called Datastax. They just decided to go full proprietary um, this year. So they used to be, hey, we built this great open source software. It's, uh, it's There's no vendor lock-in. Come use us. And now they went extreme opposite. We only, we're only pulling all our competitors on open source projects. We'll be working only on proprietary value add. Is there a network effect that comes with these? For example, like, do I want to use Spark SQL because more people use it? Like there's more engineering resources in the market? Not, 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 not really, actually. He made a good point. So a lot of enterprises, right, they would not be the first user of this kind of stuff. These are generally the startups, right, who, first of all, they don't have the deep pocket, so they can't go and buy those proprietary expensive data warehouses. So for them, it, it's easy, okay, I can download Hadoop, I can download Spark SQL and put together my own data warehouse, right? And especially in the Silicon Valley, people are more eager to try new stuff, take risk. Uh, outside of Silicon Valley, that's not true. So, um, just to add on that, it, it, there, there is a network effect though, because obviously the more uh, people that use a certain thing, the easier it is to hire. Um, That's true, yeah. So in that way, how, yeah, because you, at the end of the day, whatever technology you use, right, you want to make sure you can find people who know yeah. that stuff. One of the biggest problems with all this big data stuff is that there's not enough talent that understands um, how to use any one of this. Like you can probably find enough of them in Silicon Valley, but you can't find enough of them. It's easy to separate them. Yeah, it drops pretty quickly as soon as we start moving out of Valley. Uh, so does KPL fall under the history of query engine? Not really, actually. I'll talk about it here. <laughs> Just give me a few minutes. Yeah. So, what are the main differences between those uh, analytics databases and just the ones where you, where you mainly store information? Like, how do you how do you make those uh, analytic databases different? Like, what are the characteristics? What makes them more? I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Actually, I have a slide on that. Okay. Um, are there also nuances between how you integrate between different types of these things? So, like your distributed analytics database, like if you choose one, you might want to have to choose a specific SQL query engine. It, sometimes it is driven by your application. So let's say if you want to store a lot, lot of data, right? you have a ch choice to make between using HDFS and Tachyon or Alexia, right? HDFS is a lot cheaper because it's using this even easier traditional hard disk, whereas Alexia, right? The value comes if you can put all that data in memory, which means memory is generally a lot more expensive, actually. Right? So then it's like, okay, what's my performance requirement? How much money I can spend? All right, now there's a third category, our next category is full text search databases. So I've shown two of them here. Um, so most of you have gone to, uh, like, let's say if you want, want to buy a laptop and you go on Best Buy or Fry's, right, or even Amazon, you'll see on the left-hand side, right, you can actually filter the laptops by different criteria, by brand, how much memory it has, how much disk it has. And typically what they're using under the hood is one of these products actually. So they make it really easy. So all you do is just feed your product catalog and then you can easily actually search that. And you can, again, these are distributed data stores so you're not limited by the amount of disk or capacity that one server has. If you need more data, just keep throwing more hardware and you can easily uh, accumulate any amount of data. Um, all right, now let's talk about another important piece which is distributed computing framework. So we talked about um, here, yeah, right? You can put a lot, lot of information just as plain files, just like you store files on your computer on this server too. But what if you want to get insight from that data, right? You have collected a ton of data, you want to get insight. Now typically files itself, uh, I mean, you can't analyze the file. You can manually browse through it, but if there's, let's say 10,000 files and each file is 10 gig, there's no way you are able, you'll be able to analyze that data. And that's where you need to write applications program that can go through all those files and get the insight that you want, right? And that's what this computing frameworks allow you to do. So if you have a ton of data and you want to write a custom application, right? So there, these three things that we looked about, the object data, uh, object stores and the data, st uh, actually the data stores, right? There basically the use case was pretty standard. You're storing data, you're reading back data, or you're doing analytics, or you're doing search, right? But what if you have a custom application? And one example would be the Google example again, right? 
where basically they have a program that goes out and finds out all the web pages in the entire world, right? Now each page has some content, it has links. So there's an application that has to go through each page and figure out, okay, where is that link pointing to? And then using all that information, build an index that it then uses to give you search results when you do that, right? So that's a custom application. And there are a lot of such custom applications. So if you want to write that, that's where you will use basically a distributed computing framework. And essentially what they do is they make it easy. Remember I talked one of the challenges with um, scale out architecture is writing applications that can take advantage of that architecture is a very hard problem. <laughs> and that problem becomes very easy when you start using this computer, uh, distributed computing framework. So they actually make it really simple. They make it writing a program that can take advantage of all these resources as simple as writing a program that's running on a single computer. So you don't have to worry at all that, OK, there are 1,000 nodes. One of them can fail. How do I communicate with the nodes? All that is kind of hidden for you. All you have to do is just focus on your business logic. So again, I put, put them in certain categories, uh, or three categories. One is there are some frameworks that just focus on batch data. So typically, batch data, an example would be data that you have collected in file. Or let me take, let me take a step back, actually. So at a very high level, you can uh, classify data as basically stream data, which is basically an unbounded, infinite data set to which data is continuously appended. And in real world, most of the data is like that. So if you look at stock trading, for example, right, there's a trade happening every day. So it's an unbounded data set. Um, you look at Twitter feed, it's an unbounded data, uh, data set, right? It's a stream data. Continuously, people are adding, uh, posting new tweets. So most of the data in, in reality is stream data, right? It's not ending. But typically what happens is you capture uh, or you take a snapshot of the data and put it in a file or put it in a database. And sometimes you want to just process that amount of data, right? So it's a bounded set. And typically your program, since it's a limited amount of data that's not changing, your program can actually has a finite amount of processing that it needs to do, right? So it will start at some point. Once it's done processing that data, it's done. So the batch uh, frameworks basically just focus on programs that are processing batch data, right? It's not processing stream. And the stream uh, frameworks are de designed for processing unbounded data set. So the popular ones are the Kafka streams, Heron, Storm, Samza. And there are some frameworks, actually, that can do both, batch as well as stream. So Spark is one of those. Uh, it's probably the most popular one right now that can uh, allow you to do both. Apache Flink is another one. And there are a few more. So let's look uh, in a little bit more detail some of these frameworks. So as an example of batch and stream would be, suppose I'm Amazon, right? <coughs> batch processing is, you know, I have this whole history of your, your, pur your entire purchase history, and which dates back 10 years, and I can use that to come up with a composite picture of, of who you are, right? But then the, the stream processing is, you know, I'm moving my mouse around on, on the page, and, and that's going to, and, and presumably what I'm presented with in terms of the, the interface is going to be a combination of uh, the end result of the batch processing that they finished this morning and the, the immediate uh, feedback that it's getting from me, you know, moving my mouse around, right? Yes, that, that's, a one, that's one example. The other example could be where uh, the Amazon business executives, they want to kind of look at the business health, right? So every day they want to know, okay, exactly what was the sales in a certain geography, what was the profit and all that stuff. So basically, they're taking a snapshot of the data that they have at that point, up to that point, and then they're basically saying, okay, let's process everything that got done yesterday. So that's a batch processing. And then the other is where you said, basically, is the customer is on site, right? You're con continuously monitoring your site, uh, even to show what product to show to the user. Yeah, that's a stream processing. Or even just from an infrastructure monitoring, right? Because if you're an e-commerce site, you don't want your server to fail and not know about it. <coughs> So there you are constantly actually checking the health of your system, and the system is sending you some inf piece of information that you're constantly processing. Uh, fraud detection is another streaming use case, right? There is like the, uh, every transaction that happens is coming to you as a stream, and then you're looking at that transaction and quickly looking at the use case that you mentioned, right? Looking at some historical information and using those combination of those two, figure out if this is a real transaction or is a fraudulent transaction. All right, so let's talk about Hadoop. So Hadoop is like the big daddy of open source big data projects. It got started almost like 10 years ago. And what essentially it is, it's a cluster computing framework for processing large data sets uh, using a, a cluster of commodity servers using a simple programming model. So again, it's kind of <laughs> really, really simple programming model. Let's put it that way. 
Um, simpler than before. Right, simpler than what was there before the, uh, Hadoop came around. So some of the key features, right? It's low cost because it's basically allowing you to implement uh, scale up, uh, not scale up, scale out architecture. It's scalable, so if you, as your processing needs grows, you can just add more nodes. And there are some organizations that started, let's say, with 50 nodes, and today they might be running a few thousand node cluster. And they can just keep uh, adding more and more stuff. It's fault all and built in, and the programming model is relatively simpler. And uh, I'll talk what, what that relative part means. Now, one thing to keep in mind, when people talk about Hadoop, Hadoop is not really one single product. Today, it has become more of an ecosystem of product. But even core Hadoop consists of three components. One is the cluster manager, uh, which is basically managing the resources that spread out across your cluster. The other is the distributed compute engine. That's the framework that allows you to write distributed application, makes it really easy for you. And then the third is the file system. So the cluster manager specifically is called YAN. The compute engine is called MapReduce, and the distributed file system is HDFS, which we saw earlier. Let's talk about the one that's hot today, and that's Spark. So Spark, again, just at a high level, right? It's basically a fast, easy to use, general purpose computing framework for processing large data sets using a cluster of servers, right? So superficially, it kind of looks very similar to Hadoop, and I'll talk how exactly it is different, and uh, Renault can probably uh, add more stuff. So the first thing is, again, it, uh, <laughs> just like MapReduce, it abstracts distributed computing, right? Makes it really easy for application developers to write apps that can rec run across hundreds of nodes. They don't have to worry about all the messy details of what if something fails, what if the hard disk crashes, what if the node cannot communicate. It's scalable, just like Hadoop, right? So you could start with three node cluster and then keep adding more and more stuff as you need. Fault tolerance is built in. But what really differentiates it is, one, it's fast, really a lot faster than Hadoop. Uh, second, it's much, much easier to use compared to Hadoop. And the third is flexible, actually. So Hadoop was, had a very specific uh, use case up, uh, for which it was designed, whereas Spark, you can do a lot more uh, variety of stuff. So let me kind of go a little bit more in depth on each of those points. And this is something that I stole from Reynolds. I don't know how many slides you have. Uh, I just want to have three minutes to sure. maybe try talk from a very different perspective. Actually, it has nothing to do with Spark at all. Okay. Well, stand up and also make sure you, you tell us your, your, your backstory too. So. Okay. Actually, I don't know if you're yeah. The, can I just draw something? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it a marker I can use to keep pulling it on? Um, yeah. Like this. I want to press any button to shut all the lights. <laughs> so this is actually slightly. I, I think he gave a very good <laughs> perspective from more of a technology point of view. Um, this is actually part of the. It, it's the first half of the sales pitch usually we give, but it's we're giving it because we actually believe in this is a great summary of what's happening in the last ten years. Um, we just slice data in general into two halves. I think um, he actually kind of trends that. So the transactional processing and then this analytics. So when you think about big data, that's typically what people think talk about. It's usually not about transaction processing. And this is, for example, if you buy a book, you insert a record into a database saying somebody bought a book. This is transaction processing. Analytics is about getting um, aggregate information, for example, business intelligence. How am I how how is each one of my stores doing? Uh, or running machine learning, for example, how do I recognize the uh, uh, whether there's a cat in this picture or not. Um, so big data is typically about this. And what's happening, I would say, pre the, and let's just draw a time axis, this time. By the way, I've never used this uh, exact whiteboarding before, so bear with me if that. So let's say, like before 2000, I would say almost 2010, um, there's data warehouse, um, which uh, we haven't talked about. And data warehouse always at least so if you think about analytics, there's two parts to it. One is compute, and the other one is storage. So first of all, you need to be able to store the data to run analytics. And then once you've stored the data, you have to be able to actually run something on them. Like just pile data sitting there is completely useless. Um, so in data warehouse, the compute is SQL. Um, the storage is embedded in the data, house, data warehouse. It's sort of a couple monolithic um, thing. 
And one thing that's special about data warehouse is one is really expensive. Like it's actually not uncommon that a company pays, for example, a teradata tens of millions just to store terabytes of data. So we're gonna hear from Wells Fargo next week and they're they're a big yeah. user of, of teradata so data warehouse. Everybody is uh, trying to replace teradata right now because they're too expensive. Um, there's no there's not a lot of great other uh, options. Now uh, another problem with this is it's extremely inflexible. So in order to actually put the data into the data warehouse, you have to think a lot about how you model your data. Um, and that process itself, reconciling that across many different business units or departments in a big company can take years. Uh, literally, sometimes the data warehouse project starts say, in 2000, and by 2005, you don't even have anything in the data warehouse. Um, so Hadoop came along, I would say, so this is like pre-2010. And Hadoop kind of was started around, actually before 2010, but really vendors started um, pitching this thing. And they came along. Um, so in Hadoop case, there's an HDFS for storage. And what HDFS does is, it's very simple. It says rather than having to model and buy an expensive data warehouse, just copy your data over in its original form. It could be logs, it could be images. Don't worry about how to structure them. Just copy them over and worry about analyzing them later. And that's actually great uh, because now it's very flexible. You don't need to argue with everybody to figure out a common standard format. Just copy data over. You can duplicate it 10 times if you want. Um, the another thing is way cheaper because it runs on commodity machines. It, plus, it's open source, so vendors can charge too much money for it. Um, now, so what effectively what Hadoop, uh, Hadoop accomplished was it commoditized storage. It makes storage really cheap. Now, there's another gym everybody wants. Is what about compute? Like how do we analyze them? So there's this framework called MapReduce, which I think uh, you have one slide on. Uh, MapReduce was, uh, to summarize it, it was great for uh, the very initial use case of Google's uh, building a reverse index for the web, but it failed miserably uh, in the enterprise world. Um, even, it's actually, even for tech startups, it's too difficult to use, it was too slow. So effectively, nobody really uses this to analyze data. Sometimes they use it to copy data from one place to another, but effectively nobody really uses it. So what Hadoop accomplished really is a commoditized storage. Um, now, fast forward, let's say 2016, 17. What we want is, this is commoditized, this is now a solved problem. What's left is analytics. Everybody wants to be able to actually do analytics. They want to be able to actually express their business logic in compute. Um, so this sort of, I would say, what Spark and a lot of other things are trying to fill. Um, there's many, I think usability is a huge aspect of actually making um, sure um, compute-based analytics are actually doable because talent, again, is one of the largest gap. If you can't find enough people that understand how to use it, um, it's, you can't actually have your project take off. Um, performance is another one. You want to be able to, you don't want to wait for uh, three days for your result to come back. Um, so this is sort of, I would say, the high-level landscape. Now another kind of uh, uh, big trend that actually happened um, in the past few years is cloud computing. So a lot of major enterprises are now moving to the cloud, and everybody, I think, so we started as a cloud company in 2013, it was almost a little bit too early. Um, at the time when we talked to large enterprises, they were like, there's no freaking way for us to move our data to the cloud. Um, what about security, what about all of that? And it's 2000, late 2016, everything changed. The conversation went from, um, whether we're moving to the cloud to, it's not a question of whether, but it's when. Um, and many of them has already happened. And in the cloud case, um, one thing that's very interesting, so there's three major cloud providers, um, Google, Microsoft, and uh, Amazon, which is the dominant one. Um, all of them actually have a different storage, uh, proprietary storage backend that's not HDFS. So what we're seeing is in the cloud world, uh, which uh, if you run on Amazon S3, which I've, I've talked about, is replacing HDFS. Like people are dumping their data rather than in an open source um, cluster of HDFS. They dump into Amazon's proprietary. Uh, and is there a switching cost there in extracting your data from Amazon and moving it into Google? Right? There is a huge cost. Uh, so that's why for a lot of the cloud providers, um, their main motivation is actually to drive people to get their data in uh, because data has strong gravity. Um, compute actually has less gravity because you can move your application from one, so from Google to uh, Microsoft or from Microsoft to Amazon. There's not a huge uh, difference at the application level. But copying per 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 petabytes of data is uh, yeah, it's a very high cost. Actually, you have to send basic trucks.
to copy and canvas the data. It's faster to send hard drives than uh, copy. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, yeah. So my view is everybody's focused on actually analytics right now, storage kind of a soft problem. Both for on-premise, which is solved by HDFS, commoditized storage. In the cloud, um, each cloud provider kind of has their own proprietary solution, extremely cheap. Uh, the analytics, everybody is trying to compete right now. Well, thank you, Reynolds. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, all right, so let me just bring everything together, actually, um, in three slides. We talked about a lot of different technologies, right? How do they fit together? So in the early days, right, this is how things would look like. You would have your application um, talking to a single database in which you are doing your transaction. You're also doing the analytics. And some, as somebody pointed out, it becomes a bottleneck, actually, right? You, this becomes strained. So then people said, OK, we need to kind of separate out the functionality. And what they would typically do is, oh, because of this thing, actually. So you, each application would have its own database, and then you extract the data uh, and put it into a data warehouse where you do all the analytics. Uh, but there are a lot of applications that were not satisfied by data just being here. And that's where you use something like HDFS, so you could extract the data from the databases. Or you might even have applications writing directly into the uh, distributed data store. Uh, and you could also use the, all, some of the distributed data stores that are out there, right? And then you can build custom applications like machine learning and other apps that you want to do. Or you could have your search app. But over a period of time, this becomes very mess messy, actually, right? Because you could have hundreds of different, for an enterprise, typically they have hundreds or a few hundreds of applications. Uh, and then manage, managing all that extract, right? Somebody talked about ETL. That's what ETL is doing, basically. It becomes a messy process. So what you do is you simplify that. And one way to simplify that is you put a distributed uh, messaging system layer. So now what you do is you take data from each of these things, put it in one place, and then anybody who wants to process that data or consume that data can get it from there, right? Simplifies your architecture. And um, so on the batch processing side, right, once your data is in the distributed data store, you could use something like Spark to write your custom application to do analytics that Reynold was talking about. You can build machine learning uh, stuff, uh, thing. Or you can also actually process your data in real time. So if you have a streaming data, right, that's coming, you could write it here and directly process it as a stream instead of putting it in a database, right? So you can actually make take actions and do everything in real time. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Back to your uh, collections here. All right. Thank you. I've been alone. You guys have it. All right. I'll see you guys on Thursday.